was terrific. Um, uh, Hajun, uh, Justin said it's very dangerous to defy your comparative advantage. Um, you believe that actually it's essential to do that mm. if you're going to grow, and you come from a country that, I guess, did that. Yeah, did Why? That. Yeah, <coughs> well, uh, let me, yeah. Well, actually, the, <coughs> the differences uh, between me and Justin are actually not as large as what might appear in the first instance. And I mean, you will understand why I say this after you hear my presentation or read the article. Well, first of all, the theory of comparative advantage on which uh, Justin and most of the rest of the economics community builds uh, its view on trade and development and industrial policy is uh, actually one of the few ideas in economics that is uh, more than a common sense dressed up in mathematics. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, it's a really powerful idea. Huh? The beauty of the argument is that it shows that even a country with no absolute international cost advantage in any industry <coughs> may benefit from international trade by specializing in industries at which it is least bad. Yeah? You know, I mean, it's not, not an intuitively obvious argument. I mean, even Adam Smith uh, didn't understand it. I mean, he said that you will specialize in industries where you have absolute advantage. Yeah? Ricardo said, no, no, actually, that's not true. I mean, even if you are rubbish at everything, <laughs> you should uh, specialize in the thing in which you are the least rubbish at. Yeah? <laughs> no, I mean, this is uh, something that you uh, that, uh, do not yeah, that, uh, get uh, from common sense. Huh? And as a guide to finding out the best way to maximize your current or short-term consumption opportunities and uh, the production possibilities, given your current endowments, you cannot do better than that. Yeah? So I'm not disputing that uh, dimension. But the theory is, I think, far too insufficient a guide to understanding medium-term adjustment and long-term development. Huh? Now, let me explain why. First of all, the theory assumes a uh, perfect factor mobility. And this uh, leads it to ignore medium-term adjustment cost. I mean, a few days ago, Oliver Williamson got his uh, Nobel Prize. And uh, the, he has this notion of uh, specific assets, you know, which I actually used in some of my earlier works, which means that uh, you cannot really, you know, I mean, the, the, in theory, I mean, the, your production uh, adjusts uh, to changing patterns of trade, but uh, it's not as if uh, suddenly you, simply because you are now exporting more, say, microchips uh, than steel, your steel engineers are suddenly going to turn themselves into uh, electronics engineers. Yeah? They are specific assets. Yeah? Anyway, so I mean, we, we uh, talk about this issue uh, in the debate, <coughs> and I mean, I'm uh, the, the I also want to point out that I yeah, that, that got to learn a couple of very important points uh, from Justin's uh, the, the, uh, criticism against me in this respect. Now, as uh, he points out in the debate, these costs can be incorporated into mainstream trade models. Huh? But the trouble is that few people have actually done it. And certainly, when it comes to policy advice, these <coughs> issues have <coughs> been more or less ignored. Huh? <coughs> so. I mean, I was uh, in the debate encouraging uh, or, or the, the pleading uh, the more or less uh, that, uh, to Justin that uh, he should yeah, encourage other people to do it. Yeah? So we need to build that uh, specifically into our understanding. Huh? Secondly, the uh, theory assumes that there is one best practice technology that everyone can use. And this more or less assumes away the very thing that separates a developed country from a developing country, which is the latter's lack of capability to use and, more importantly, generate sophisticated technology. Yeah? So in this world, if uh, Ecuador is not producing things like the BMW, it's not because it cannot, but because it shouldn't. Yeah? Because that it is assumed that, 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 that technology is available to everyone that, to equal extent. Huh? I mean, Ecuador doesn't produce BMWs only because it's uh, uh, out of line with this uh, uh, factor in Durban, huh? not because it cannot technologically handle making such cars. 
the, the link to the deficiency in the understanding of technology in the mainstream trade theory is this uh, poor understanding of the factor accumulation process. You know, following the theory of comparative advantage, you should enter an industry which has the capital intensity that is in line with your capital labor ratio just at the right moment. So you wait until you know, your factor endowment uh, comes in line with you know, the, uh, the capital intensity of the, the sector you want to enter, and then you enter. But in practice, you cannot really do that because factor accumulation does not happen as an abstract process. Huh? Okay, there are some general use machines, but most physical capital is accumulated in concrete form, such as machine tools for car parts industry or textile machine. Once again, yeah, Williamson's uh, specific assets. Huh? Human capital is also accumulated in concrete forms. Yeah? You don't produce a general engineer. You produce either an electronics engineer or a mechanical engineer or a civil engineer. Yeah? I mean, there's some substitutability between these people, but it's uh, highly imperfect. Huh? Actually, this uh, that, that, uh, <coughs> leads me to point out that, that for <coughs> this reason, actually, this debate about whether we should do general industrial policy or specific industrial policy is uh, largely false. Huh? Because uh, whatever policy you do, you are going to discriminate that, that some people against another. Yeah? R&D policy, I mean, does it uh, treat all forms equally? No. I mean, if you are giving R&D subsidies, you are discriminating against uh, small labor-intensive firms uh, which uh, do not do much R&D. Eh? So that, uh, actually, it's uh, only a matter of degree. I mean, all policy, I mean, there's no such thing as uh, general industrial policy unless you want to call something like a primary education industrial policy, which I don't think is uh, very helpful. Yeah? So you always target, you always ask specific the question is, uh, what is the optimum degree of targeting given your situation? Yeah? It could be highly yeah, specific, depending on who you are, what industries you want to enter. It could be relatively general, like R&D subsidies. Yeah? So the, unless you have already accumulated the right types of physical and human capital, you cannot really enter and succeed in an industry even if is capital intensity is right for your country's factor profile. Huh? So that's uh, the, the one the important uh, the kind of, uh, limit uh, to the theory of comparative advantage uh, when it comes to actually implementing it. Huh? Next, uh, complicating the picture even more is the fact that most technological capabilities are accumulated through concrete production experiences and at that in the form of collective knowledge, often embodied in organizational routines and institutional memories. Huh? This means that if, even if a country has all the right machines, right engineers, and right or workers before it enters an indus in, in, industry, which is not possible anyway, as I have just mentioned, it still cannot be, at, uh, sorry, they still cannot be combined into an internationally competitive form overnight because they actually need to be put through a learning process before they can acquire all the necessary technological capabilities. Huh? And this uh, process is potentially very lengthy. Britain and the US maintain some of the highest tariff rates in the world for industries for 100, 120 years during their respective catch-up periods. Japan had to protect and subsidize its car industry and ban foreign direct investment in the sector for nearly four decades before it could become competitive in the world market. It took the electronic subsidiary of Nokia 17 years before it made any profit, during which period it had to be cross-subsidized by sister <coughs> companies in Nokia Group. Huh? So we are uh, talking about that, that, that very lengthy, potentially very lengthy the learning process. I mean, it can be shorter. I mean, that, for example, when Korea entered the steel industry that, uh, against the advice of uh, everyone you can think of. It uh, basically took them uh, about 10 years uh, to become internationally competitive. So I'm not saying that it always uh, needs to involve 100 years or 40 years, but it can be quite lengthy because this uh, learning process is uh, quite difficult. Huh? So <clears throat> And 
I mean, the, the, you would have noticed from these examples that it wasn't just the East Asian countries that succeeded through some form of industrial policy, but most of uh, today's rich countries. You know, I mean, uh, when you debate industrial policy, uh, many people often say, oh, you know, the, you cannot really generalize from three countries. Yeah? Uh, so out of, say, 100 countries that have uh, tried industrial policies, uh, only three countries succeeded. Hmm? But uh, my reading of history is that actually the hit rate is uh, much higher because uh, the, the virtually all of uh, today's rich countries use the uh, protection subsidies and other industrial policies when they were developing. So I would say it's uh, more like 30 out of 100 rather than you know, 3 out of 100. Anyway, that's another story that I tell in my the books uh, like Kicking Away the Ladder and Bad Samaritans. Uh, the, 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 let's uh, leave it at that. So for all these reasons, a country's specialization is what it is only because someone somewhere, maybe a private entrepreneur, maybe the government, more likely two of them together, made a decision to develop competencies in those particular activities. You know, when you think about it, uh, is there any natural or even factor endowment driven reasons for the Japanese to be good at making, making cars? Huh? For God's sake, I mean, the country doesn't even have enough land to drive around. Yeah? <laughs> and why are the Finns good at making mobile telephones? Huh? You know, I can understand the Koreans because uh, we, like the Italians, we uh, like to talk. Yeah? <laughs> so if we could, uh, we would rather carry our phone. Yeah? But the Finns, come on, I mean, uh, you know, they are very capable people, but one thing, if there is one thing they cannot do, that's talking. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, a Norwegian friend of mine uh, told me this uh, joke that, uh, that, uh, that there were uh, two Finnish guys uh, sitting in a bar drinking and they keep drinking uh, vodka uh, without saying anything for like half an hour. <coughs> and then one of them suddenly <coughs> says, it's a very nice day today. And the other one doesn't respond. And about half an hour later, the other one says, are we here to talk or to drink? <laughs> Well, Norwegians uh, themselves are not exactly that, 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 that talkative, but, you know, I mean, Finns, uh, that's another story, huh? Well, I mean, <laughs> giving you these uh, jokes are uh, just to illustrate how, yeah, I mean, except at the very basic level, I mean, uh, which everyone does in, in the beginning, yeah, because uh, you have nothing <coughs> else uh, you can do, yeah? So the Finns, yes, uh, they used to cut down trees, yeah? Uh, the Japanese, they used to grow silkworms and uh, make silk. Huh? But beyond that level, I mean, the, what you become good at is uh, the not naturally given, not, not given by your yeah, kind of generalized uh, factor in endowment. Yeah? Is it the cars or the mobile telephones or the biotechnology? You have to choose. You have to invest in building a uh, certain uh, the profile of uh, physical capital. You have to invest in building human capital of certain types. You have to, as uh, Justin pointed out, uh, invest in building certain type of infrastructure and institutions. Huh? Given all this, I argue that uh, deviation from one's comparative advantage is not only compatible with, but usually necessary for industry upgrading and economic development. I agree with Justin that our country should not defy its comparative advantage too much because it is uh, costly. You know, you are sacrificing current consumption benefit, uh, current benefits of specialization in order to, if you like, invest in building some new activities in, new, in the future. So you are you know, the paying the cost. <coughs> so you shouldn't pay too much of this cost. But on the other hand, if you simply stick to your comparative advantage, you will not develop. Yeah? So I actually suggested to Justin that uh, there might be some kind of uh, U-shaped, yeah? inverted U-shaped uh, relationship. Yeah? So you have to deviate uh, from your comparative advantage uh, to an extent. So deviation in the beginning increases your growth rate. And after a point, yeah, it might uh, reduce it. Yeah? OK, I mean, uh, how the curve looks and so on, I don't know. But you know, we basically have to get away from linear thinking. Yeah? You know, I mean, when you think about it, it's so obvious. I mean, that, that you know, well, unless you are from North Korea, the ones that are recommending you know, infinity percent of uh, tariff, yeah, 
On the other hand, I don't think that the zero percent tariff is that uh, good for <laughs> development. Huh? Now, Justin says that the deviation should be small, and at the general level, I can agree with it, but historical examples from successful economists suggest that it can be sometimes huge. Yeah? I mean, for example, when Japan was giving a big push to the automobile and other capital intensive industries in the late 50s and early 60s, its per capita income was 5% uh, uh, sorry, 20, less than 20% that of the US level. Huh? So what was it really following its uh, comparative advantage? I mean, if you are not convinced by that example, how about Korea? When Korea entered the steel industry in 1968, its per capita income was uh, less than uh, that just over 5% out of the U.S. per capita income. Huh? When it entered the semiconductor industry in 1983, its per capita income was still just 14% out of the U.S. So, uh, I mean, these uh, deviations uh, can be quite large. Huh? Now, of course, we could argue that these countries would have been better off if they entered these industries later when their capital labor ratios were more in line with what were required for these industries. Yeah, at the general level, I can accept that argument. But uh, do not forget that there are a lot of uncertainties about this uh, learning process. So, you know, but, uh, everyone, just about everyone thought that uh, Korea entering the steel industry, you know, when it's uh, power capital income was 5% that of the US was premature, but uh, that they were proven wrong. Yeah? On the other hand, yeah, I mean, that, that, that should the Japanese have uh, stuck to car industry for 40 years? I mean, in the end, it uh, paid off, but uh, maybe if it uh, started a bit later, it might have been better off. But I mean, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, you could argue that Korea should have entered the steel industry not in 1968, but in 1988, when its uh, per capita income was around, say, 20% of that of the US, I mean, in my view, even 20% may be too low, but that's another debate. Can we say that? Maybe, maybe not, because the question is whether Korea's per capita income in 1988 would have been even 20% of the US had Korea not entered steel, automobile, shipbuilding, and all the other wrong industries in the late 60s and early 70s, huh? when it's a uh, per capita income is basically between 5 and 10% that of the US, I'm thinking not just about the higher potential for output and productivity growth in these industries. I'm also thinking about the fact that without these industries maturing into leading export industries between the late 70s, starting with ship steel and shipbuilding, and the mid 1980s, uh, the, the automobile and so on, Korea would not have had the foreign exchanges that it needed in order to import advanced technologies necessary for industry upgrading. And uh, kind of uh, the theoretical implication for this uh, example is that uh, the, this uh, usual debate between yeah, import substitution and uh, export uh, is uh, also false, yeah? because you need to do both. Huh? Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is not that the theory of comparative advantage is uh, wrong, Yes. Within its uh, narrow confine, it is absolutely correct, but the process of industry upgrading and economic development is way too complex to be guided by an abstract and narrow theory like the theory of comparative advantage. I would say that the theory of comparative advantage is like the compass. Yeah? It gives you vital information on where you are, but it is not going to tell you where to go or even less how to get there. Yeah? We need to know many more things about technological learning, organizational dynamics, institution building, different forms of market and government failures, and the real life cases of successes and failures in order to give useful advice on how countries can determine their destinations and the method of getting there in the course of industry upgrading and economic development. Thank you.